Hello. I know I'm starting a little bit early today, but and I'm doing it from the coffee shop and there's a million people around here and everything else, but I was running so late. Constance and I went to the store this morning. Uh, that rather than be a lot late and miss my coffee, I thought I'd do it right here from the, the coffee shop this morning. I hope you don't mind. I hope you don't think it's too informal or, or that I'm rambling too much as I've been criticized for doing. Uh, just to remind you, I do this every day, seven days a week. 12 months of the year, ever since the pandemic. So we're coming up on three years. So uh, I apologize if it's not a, uh, if a smooth uh, introductory uh, thing with, with bumper music and things like that. It's just you and me. Okay. Uh, as you know, if you've been uh, following uh, last couple of days here i'm i'm uh, just finishing up a, a book and that sort of uh, uh puts you in a in a strange uh state state of mind you uh, talk about being an absent-minded professor when you're focused on uh, on um, on writing for uh, five or six uh, uh good hours a day and a couple of bad hours <laughs> hours uh, thrown in uh, but still uh, I enjoy doing this in the in the mornings but uh, my mind is uh, uh, kind of focused 24/7 uh, on the, the the current focus of the text and uh, right now it's uh, the tarot and the, the Hebrew alphabet uh, uh, right now associated with uh, uh, the 22 trumps and the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, and uh, in gathering my thoughts, uh, I, I turned to my own, my own works uh, primarily to see what I've said in the past about things. And uh, uh, I, I turned to the, the Chicken Kabbalah, which is one of my favorite books. Uh, I get, still get a kick out of it. And I want to share this with you today because today is so-called uh, uh, Pi Day, uh, 317. Uh, I say a little something about Pi in this section here, but mostly I say something about Phi, P-H-I, uh, which is another uh, irrational number or whatever they call it. So I'm going to do that from the coffee shop, and if anyone else listens in, uh, let them be edified too. Do you hear that wind? I hope this is not going to be uh, unpleasant for you. Anyway, I'm reading off my Kindle today, so it's the, the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, starts off with the epigram. Uh, Tav looks like a resh holding a dead dolphin by the tail. And that's a quote from Rabbi Ben Clifford. There's no escaping it. Even little Asia's chicken cabalists need to learn the Hebrew alphabet and at least some of the traditional correspondences. As Rabbi Ben Clifford said in Frequently Asked Questions, this doesn't mean that you'll have to learn, speak, or read the Hebrew language. In fact, once you've learned the Hebrew alphabet and its Kabbalistic and uh, numerical secrets, you'll most likely spend a lot of time examining English words and letters using their Hebrew equivalents. Another thing that's absolutely necessary for your study is a small basic library of reference works. You don't need to have these books right now, but you'll want to have them very soon. Of course, you'll collect more books as you descend into Kabbalistic madness. But these texts, and this book, of course, will be enough to get you on the road. And the books I uh, recommended uh, back here when I wrote this uh, was Aleister Crowley's 777 and other Kabbalistic writings, David Godwin's Kabbalistic, uh, Godwin's Kabbalistic Encyclopedia, 
and just the simple uh, Yehuda ben uh, or Ehud ben Yehuda's uh, uh, pocket English Hebrew Hebrew English dictionary. And of course, I, I could recommend far many more works right now. We must remember that Ben Clifford wrote this little 25 page essay, and we're not going to read it all, please don't think, uh, simply to help beginning students remember how to recognize and correctly draw each Hebrew letter. I believe he succeeded admirably in doing this. Uh, Several of his descriptions evoke bizarre and unforgettable images. Tav looks like a, a resh holding a dead dolphin by the tail, or Lamed looks like a snake that has swallowed a brick and is now having second thoughts. As a purely Kabbalistic work, however, this essay is far from comprehensive. His comments on the letters are limited primarily to basic definitions of the letters. Occasionally, he muses briefly about how the primitive meanings may be applied to cosmic, psychological, or sexual principles. But for the most part, he seems satisfied to offer simply an appetizer to food for thought, further food for thought. The stunning exception is found in his comments on the letter Yod. I strongly urge the reader to carefully read and reread that section. In 210 words, Ben Clifford casually reveals the supreme symbolic secret of creation by drawing our attention to that most mysterious natural number known to mathematicians as the Greek letter phi, and to architects as the golden mean or the golden section. This number or ratio, 1.618033033988847499, like the irrational number pi, seems to issue from and set the pattern for the basic structure of the entire cosmos. But unlike other abstract numbers, the pattern set by phi is revealed naturally and universally in all living things and all things that grow and develop in stages. One of the most striking examples of this pattern of growth can be found in the shell of the Nautilus, which when cross-sectioned reveals a breathtakingly repeating pattern of what looks like extended Hebrew yods or the English letter G. On a grander scale, it can be found in the formation of the great spiral nebulae. This primal pattern of patterns is indeed the G signature of the great architect of the universe, the name by which Freemasons refer to deity. As far as I know, Ben Clifford is the first Kabbalist or alleged Kabbalist to make this profound fundamental connection. And there's, a, there's an image of the yin-yang. There's the yuds, a couple yuds. And then there's the golden mean and the Hebrew letter yod. I think it's reversed for you there. I suppose inevitably there'll be those who view as crude and offensive Ben Clifford's sexual allusions to the Hebrew letters and other elements of Kabbalistic study. Admittedly, at first glance, it, it does appear that he places an inordinate emphasis on phalluses and vaginas and wombs and sperm and such. As he's no longer here to defend himself, I feel I must say a few words on the rabbi's behalf. For the last 2,000 years, there's been a concerted effort by those who would guide the spiritual life of Western civilization to divorce human life from nature on one end of the scale and from God 
on the other. We are taught that we are superior to other things because we were created in the image of deity and can do what we damn well please with the environment and the creatures around us. At the same time, we're told that deity is outside of us, that we stand eternally separated from it because of an ambiguous act of disobedience committed by our mythological ancestors, that we are cursed by the simple act of being born. Ben Clifford's Seventh, Eighth, and Ninth Command Rants clearly expose this spiritual schizophrenia as a cruel and unwholesome fraud. And those command rants are everything in heaven and earth is connected to everything in heaven and earth. Everything in heaven and earth is the reflection of everything in heaven and earth. And everything in heaven and earth contains the pattern of everything in heaven and earth. Nothing can be separated from anything else, including all aspects of human condition. To discuss sexual matters within a religious context is as proper as discussing matters of scripture or mathematics or physics. Since a great deal of our time is already spent thinking about sex, it's only logical that a significant part of our meditations on any subject should be dominated by the universal truths inherent in sexual imagery. Ben Clifford was fond of misquoting Freud and often told his students, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, and sometimes it's the supreme creative force of the universe. I applaud Ben Clifford's healthy attitude and casual candor. Furthermore, I can say with some small measure of authority that much of what he has to say in this area reveals the most profound level of understanding. I advise the serious student to ponder his words carefully to those who are still offended and embarrassed by the rabbi's comments, I say, Thank you for buying this book. Now grow up. And I think I say, I'm just going to read just a paragraph or two from the, the next little chapter, which is just simply meet the Hebrew alphabet. Did God speak Hebrew? Hell no. God's a chicken cabalist and doesn't worry about it. Do you actually think that a white bearded giant in the clouds who created the universe and everything in it belching by belching out nouns and verbs right out of some celestial edition of Ben Yehuda's Hebrew dictionary? I don't think so. The creative fiat, the language of the deity is not one of grunts and gurgles and hisses and sighs. It's a language of numbers. Numbers do all the work. What distinguishes the Hebrew alphabet is not its pronunciation or its words and grammar, but its intimate relationship with numbers. If God said anything at the beginning, it was most likely, let there be three. That's all that that uh, needed to be said because as we learned in the Sefer Yetzira, the number, th the three dimensions then just took off from the central point to instantly form seven and 12 spatial coordinates, a tight little 22 piece toolbox of creation. Okay, that's where I am gonna stop it today. So far, I've been pretty lucky that no one has gotten too loud around me, I, I hope. And here's a kind of a view of where I've been sitting doing this this morning. And uh, I apologize again for starting uh, early with the show, but I hope this worked and it's a little change of pace. And until tomorrow, uh, continue to be good to yourself, be good to each other. Happy Pi Day. 
Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love and your will.